the next presentation uh, is one that's new. We just released the report uh, that had Compass and UMass recommendations with regard to payment reform. But um, uh, while we're setting up, we do have a presentation that's going to show up on the slides. I just wanted to, to say a thing or two about how we got to this point. Um, as Commissioner Savini said, this is the third part of our project as it relates to payment reform. And a couple of years ago, we were able to apply for federal grants, and the federal grants have funded essentially all of this work. Those grants were intended to, to provide resources to states to focus on the, the cost of health insurance and premium rate review. And we realized we couldn't talk about the cost of health insurance without dealing with payment reform. I said, yeah, well, we should design a project around payment reform where we try to further that discussion and perhaps make some, some changes in New Hampshire. We realized if we were going to do anything significant, we were probably going to do what Medicare hadn't been able to in 50 years. Um, being the insurance department, that wasn't really our role either. Um, but as we started to put the project together, we realized, okay, before we can get recommendations on payment reform, we first need to figure out exactly what's going on now. There are several of us at the department who worked in provider contracting for insurers in our past, but we didn't have current information. We knew a lot about what's going on with ACOs, and we knew a lot about our insurance markets. So we realized, okay, let's do what I think of as an environmental, environmental assessment first. And that was the first report, the Friedman and UMass uh, report that the executive summary is out front. We also realized that, geez, you know, we're looking for a, a lot of things as they relate to the project, including the legal issues related to payment reform. Wow, we're probably going to need a different organization to focus on that. And then finally, we thought, OK, well, what we really want, too, is somebody to stick their neck out and come up with some recommendations around payment reform that could potentially be embraced in New Hampshire. But these shouldn't be recommendations just for the insurance department. I mean, we're a regulator of insurance, but there's a lot going on in the state. So, OK, we're going to design this third part of the project as developing recommendations that are generally good ideas for the state. They're not recommendations for the insurance department. The insurance department doesn't necessarily agree with the recommendations, but we want some consultant, somebody who's knowledgeable about these issues, to really just put something out there as a straw man, if nothing else. We can tear it down, we can build it up, we can move things around a bit, but somebody who's willing to take the risk and say what they think should be done in New Hampshire. And that's what we have today. We've got Compass Health Analytics and the UMass Center for Health Law and Economics, both consultants that we have used in the past, and they've always delivered great products. I mean, as you do this, and we've done a lot of RFPs and contracts recently, you realize that, that some contractors are just really good, and others you sort of get what you expected, and very occasionally get somebody that just didn't seem to understand the project. I would say with the three different organizations that were here, Manat, Compass, and UMass, they've been one of some of our exceptional contractors. So on, on that note, I, I welcome the, the, the folks from, from UMass and, and Compass. We've got Jim Highland, um, we've got um, Catherine London, and we've got somebody I, I know a little bit less, Rachel. Um, Thank you. Um, and I'll hand it over to, to them to, to give you our recommendations for New Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Tyler. <clears throat> uh, I'm a health economist by training, and um, I like to point out to audiences uh, uh, that are not economists uh, that there are three kinds of economists. Um, those that are good at math and those that aren't. Um, so. uh, <clears throat> so today my colleagues and I uh, will be providing an overview of uh, our uh, project and its recommendations. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, we'll be necessarily high level. Uh, the issues we're addressing are pretty complex and uh, interrelated. Um, the project report that uh, Tyler referenced will be um, you know, goes into a lot more detail, and of course, we're uh, available for questions after we present. Um, okay. So. All right. So um, our team uh, again. I'm Jim Highland. I'm the president of Compass Health Analytics, based in Portland, Maine. Uh, we partnered with uh, the UMass Center for Health Law and Economics on the project, and uh, I'm. Uh, partnering with my colleagues, uh, Catherine London and Rachel Gershon. Our colleagues, uh, Julia Feldman and uh, Carol Gierno, were not able to be with us today, but also participated on our team. <clears throat> so the scope of the project, uh, as set out for us by uh, the department, um, was uh, to develop recommendations for strategies that support payment reform, uh, and to include specifically uh, support for new value-based payment methods, uh, including ACOs. 
Um, th uh, this scope was defined to specifically build on the prior work that uh, uh, Tyler just uh, described uh, by Bennett and by uh, my colleagues at UMass. Um, and the scope also uh, was intended to specifically include the specific um, context here in New Hampshire, of course. Um, and you know, in that includes the uh, nationally prominent uh, transparency uh, efforts that, uh, that Joel mentioned, um, and uh, also uh, other things uh, that you all are aware of that are happening in the environment here. Um, you've had uh, uh, two uh, uh, state innovation model grants, uh, one, <coughs> one that's already <coughs> been carried out and one that uh, uh, just is coming uh, underway here. Um, to help promote uh, delivery system and payment reforms. Um, you have Medicaid expansion, uh, which is sort of uh, underway and uh, launching fully uh, this summer. Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, ACO activity here in New Hampshire, both uh, Medicare and commercial contract ACOs, uh, some of which uh, include provider risk assumption. Uh, and of course, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of basic population density issue that we just uh, were just touched on in the, in the discussion about uh, a, a small population and, and uh, even in the more populated parts of the state, not a high density uh, population uh, is, a, is a critical issue <coughs> here in how we think about the uh, recommendation. Uh, so here's our, uh, so the, the topics we're gonna cover are um, uh, described here on this slide. My part of the presentation, I'm going to describe the, uh, the problem that we are, we're addressing, uh, the goals of the study, and an overview of the approach. Catherine's going to then um, go into more detail on our approach and talk about our first um, uh, of three uh, primary uh, strategic recommendations. Uh, and then uh, Rachel will talk about the second and third, uh, and um, then also talk about the short-term steps in the standalone action. So the, the, there, there are three comprehensive strategies. The short-term steps are more manageable sized, uh, shorter-term actions that can be taken right away that move in the directions of the, of the comprehensive strategies. And then the two, there are two standalone actions that we think uh, even if the strategic directions weren't adopted, make sense and are worth considering. Uh, after that, we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Okay, so the problem to be solved. Um, the, uh, one of the previous projects uh, conducted by UMass looked at uh, market concentration in the provider and insurer markets, um, and they used a, a standard uh, index uh, measuring market concentration or degree of competitiveness. Um, the, the more concentrated, the less competitive uh, the market. And uh, the uh, finding was that needed, both the uh, uh, provider market and the uh, carrier market here exhibit uh, market concentration. Um, so the fact that uh, we say that the market is not uh, perfectly competitive does not mean that uh, the entities in the markets uh, don't compete with each other at all. Uh, but it does mean <laughs> that the entities have enough market power that they can uh, set or at least influence prices in, in, in uh, the markets that they operate in. Uh, and that um, is uh, not the sort of world of perfect competition where uh, the, the participants um, have to take a price that the market has established. This market situation has led to a uh, what is now a, a fairly long history of, of rapid cost growth in New Hampshire. Um, over the period 1990 to 2009, uh, the total per, per capita costs in the state moved from uh, 32nd in the country to 9th in the country. Um, that was an average growth rate over that uh, long 20 year period of 6.6%. Uh, um, and the, uh, over the same period, uh, public sector costs per person for Medicare and Medicaid were actually below average. Uh, so, the, you know, the implication there is that the uh, cost growth uh, overall in the market is attributable to what's happening in the commercial sector, uh, which in New Hampshire constitutes about two-thirds of covered persons uh, are in private insurance, and that's actually uh, the highest proportion in the country. So what, what is this, what's the source of, of this cost growth? Um, prior work uh, conducted by the department 
uh, showed that there have been large increases in provider prices in recent years, uh, specifically over the period 2010 uh, to 2013. Um, these uh, increases, um, along with uh, dramatic increases in deductibles and other cost sharing, uh, have exposed consumers to much lar larger out-of-pocket costs, and a response uh, to the response to which has been an actual decline uh, in utilization. Um, and so the provider price increases uh, have been masked by uh, in, in, these, in this period by moderate growth in insurance premiums, but the, the moderate growth in those nominal insurance premiums uh, is happening because of the increased cost sharing in the, in the products, and so the, the level of coverage in the products is declining over time. And so the, if you uh, adjust for um, that change in, in the level of coverage or, or put uh, in a similar fashion, if you include uh, the consumer's out-of-pocket costs, um, the cost growth over the period has been more like 6 to 8 percent. Uh, so, uh, you know, continuing rapid uh, cost growth, even in uh, recent periods, which nationally have had uh, fairly moderate cost growth, um, and I think the, uh, I'll just uh, add that um, while um, cost sharing uh, certainly uh, allows for consumers to have uh, skin in the game and, and allows and makes them think about prices more, <coughs> uh, more uh, than they do under full, fuller coverage, um, re, you know, research has uh, indicated that people aren't very good at distinguishing uh, care from what, that they that they don't necessarily need from care that they really do need, and so that um, health outcomes in in situations where they're high cost sharing um, can become uh, problematic. So, it, uh, how much is enough? I think is you know certainly a question for ongoing debate, but uh, uh, it's not a you know I don't think a foregone conclusion that more cost sharing is good uh, because of the incentives. Um, so. So the goals, um, you know, this, this kind of cost problem uh, sets the stage for the, the goals for uh, the reforms that we're recommending, um, which, uh, you know, first of all, start with uh, moderating cost growth. Um, and that is, that's not to say uh, an absolute decline in cost, but um, reducing the level of uh, or the rate of growth over time um, in a way that allows providers and carriers to maintain um, access to care and quali quality of care and also to make sure that the organizations can uh, maintain solvency. And f finally, uh, we want to, of course, make sure that the particular circumstances here in New Hampshire are taken into account. Um, you know, more specifically, the cost goal um, inc includes um, encouraging uh, an appropriate level of uh, consumer out-of-pocket spending, um, reducing growth rate in actuarial uh, value-adjusted premiums, that is in a, in a constant benefit package level premium. Uh, in other words, that n not just nominal uh, rate of growth in premiums, but uh, adjusting for the level of coverage in those, that those premiums um, are buying. Um, also to reduce the growth rate and disparity in provider prices and uh, shift utilization to the most appropriate mix and level. So, um, <clears throat> quick overview on the approach. Um, we we uh, reviewed the work uh, of the prior uh, studies commissioned by the department um, and evalu evaluated the uh, environment here in New Hampshire. Um, we then generated a, a, a wide list of, of potential uh, options for, for reform. Uh, that list uh, was something we called the wide net. We had used a very uh, kind of loose a uh, wide range of, of options, uh, didn't preclude things um, at the outset. Um, and then we developed a set of criteria uh, that we evaluated the um, options against. Uh, when we applied those criteria and came up with a much a smaller, uh, more manageable uh, number of options, which we then grouped into uh, strategies uh, that together we believe uh, can create components of a well-functioning healthcare system. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine now, who will go through this more this approach in more detail. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Make this short person height. Um, so. 
Um, as Jim mentioned, so we started with um, looking at work that had been done in the past, some of which had been done by my colleagues at UMass Medical Center, um, starting with a, an analysis we had done a couple of years ago um, looking at price variations, that was this one, um, where we looked at the variation in prices that commercial health insurers pay to hospitals in New Hampshire. And we found that there's a really wide variation in prices that are paid. Um, even after adjusting for uh, patient acuity or case mix, um, the prices for the same services paid to different hospitals by the same carrier vary twofold. So, and, and there's not really strong evidence about why that might be. Those prices are um, correlated with um, the hospital's own costs but they're not correlated with the hospital's profitability. So just because a hospital is being paid very high rates doesn't mean that it's actually profitable. Um, and it's also not correlated with payer mix, as you might have thought. Um, so that's where we started. And then the next analysis that um, Tyler had mentioned around the stakeholder views. So um, we, for this analysis, we worked with Friedman Healthcare and um, actually, Gabriella Lockhart is here from Friedman in the back somewhere. You can wave. Um, and our team went out and we interviewed 26 stakeholders from around New Hampshire. And these were representatives of providers and payers and consumers and employers and so on around the state. And we collected, you know, just what were people thinking about what's going on in New Hampshire, where we need to be going. Um, and we also did some analysis to, to put some data together with the views. So the most striking thing was that every single stakeholder we talked to expressed concern about the rising cost of health care in New Hampshire, that that is really f forefront on everyone's mind. And when you're talking about consumers, you know, consumers are paying more and more every year, and that is just um, unsustainable over time. And also that most stakeholders felt that there's very little competition in the health care industry in New Hampshire. Um, and that hospitals and physicians tend to be more collaborative with each other than competitive. And people felt that competition was not working to keep costs down in New Hampshire. But that's usually, you know, we expect that, you know, if you're a large number of buyers and sellers, right, that, that the way the market works is there's competition. And if somebody else raises, raises their price too high, people will go to the lower cost place. That's what brings costs down. That's not happening here. So we need to find another way. And the recommendations that came out of the stakeholder group um, interviews was that people were looking to the state to develop one unified vision for how New Hampshire should move forward to promote better health in New Hampshire, to improve quality of care, and to contain costs. And people were actually looking to the New Hampshire Insurance Department to play a convening role to bring all of you together to figure out what the strategy is. And so that's really what brought us here today. Oh, and um, we also looked at Manette's analysis, which you just heard about, um, where Manette looked at um, risk bearing, fraud and abuse, antitrust, other legal issues. That was clearly a um, foundation, but I'm not going to go into that because you just heard about it from Joel. Um, as Jim mentioned, we looked at a really wide net of potential options. We tried to not rule anything out. We started with a really light touch of just price transparency all the way down to rate setting and single payer, really put everything out there. And I'm not going to go through these in detail right now. They're in the report if you want to read about them. Um, and we spent some time figuring out how to narrow down from that very wide set of strategies to strategies that would work in New Hampshire. And we had a, a long list of criteria that we applied, starting with political feasibility here in New Hampshire. How well do each of these strategies fit with the culture in New Hampshire? How well are people likely to respond to those? Um, how likely is each strategy to contain costs in New Hampshire, to improve quality, to improve access? Does each strategy provide consumer empowerment, meaning providing information to consumers so that they can make more informed decisions about their own health? Um, what are the legal hurdles? Are there federal laws that prevent um, implementation of any of these strategies? Are there state laws that would need to be changed or regulations? What are the administrative costs? You know, what would you have to build in terms of infrastructure in order to implement one of these strategies? And then also alignment with Medicaid and Medicare, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So as we were th thinking about all of these criteria and looking at all the strategies, 
four things really jumped out as sort of the critical components that if you want to be successful with payment reform in New Hampshire, that you really need to have these four components. So one is that you want to have a system that builds in incentives for improving quality and containing costs. And as we've talked about, you know, normally in, in a well-functioning competitive marketplace, you expect that the, you know, they call it the invisible hand of the market will work to provide these incentives. But where that doesn't seem to be working, it's worth thinking about how the state can build in explicit incentives for improving quality and containing costs. Um, and, um, and applying them, you know, when, when we talk about how to do this, it may turn out that um, you need to adjust these based on different parts of the state, as we talked about, that there are different size providers, there are different markets in different places. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a uniform set of incentives exactly, but it does need to be consciously built in from the start. The second thing is consensus, that, you know, all of you are here today because you really care about this and you have opinions about it. You may have been one of those people who said, you know, we need to come together and figure out how we're doing this. There needs to be a forum to allow everybody to have some input on how we move forward together as a state. If you're going to have one common vision, it actually needs to represent the wide range of stakeholders who are here today and work for everybody. Another key thing is collaboration and alignment. So I know that a number of providers are already working in ACO-like models or moving to implement ACO models. If you're working with Medicare and Medicaid and a number of commercial payers, if each of those payers are moving in different directions, it's really difficult for a provider to have different strategies for different patients based on who they think the payer might end up being. If you're going to build, an, as a provider, if you're building an infrastructure, you're building a system for taking care of patients, you really kind of have to do more or less the same thing for all your patients. You're moving in one standard direction. And you can't be, it's not going to work if you're being pulled in different directions from different payers. And on the payer side, if you've got provider groups that are moving in very different directions, it's really difficult to manage all of those contracts and build infrastructure for those different contracts that are moving in different directions. So having some kind of uniform strategy, some agreed upon standards, will make a huge difference across the board in terms of administrative costs, systems, being able to build things. And yet, you know, it does require getting people to buy in. And so those things are, are um, work. It's a lot of work for you guys. Um, and then the final thing is to think about consequences for inaction. So assuming that we get to the point where we've gotten to this agreed upon vision and how everyone's moving forward, there need to be some consequences for not getting with the program. If you know most people are kind of moving forward and others are just not, um, you really want to have something to motivate them to get on board. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go through the strategies. Um, as Jim mentioned, see recommendation. Oops, I'm sorry. What did I do? Okay. Um, we, we took these various strategies that we were talking about and we kind of bucketed them. The ones, there were some that we just sort of took off the table as not really working in New Hampshire and others that just seemed to fit together into comprehensive strategies. And, and these are not mutually exclusive. You can do all of these. It might be a lot to bite, bite off to do a lot of things at once. But these are some sort of general directions that you could choose to take. So, um, and we'll go through the in more, these in more detail, but generally, the first one is to establish some statewide benchmarks and measure against them. The second is um, developing some strategies that the state can take to promote alternative payment methods. And the third involves studying options for strengthening purchasing power. And we do note that all of these require some, you know, there's some cost involved in developing any of these kinds of strategies and moving forward at the state level, and so you'll need to keep that in mind. So. Okay, so then the first, so I'm going to spend a little time on the first strategy. So this idea is that the state could set goals, set benchmarks for where it wants to be. Jim was talking about that cost growth has been running in the 68% range, and that's really high. And the state could decide to set a benchmark for cost growth of where it wants to be and hold healthcare entities 
to that benchmark. And you could, there are a lot of ways you could set a benchmark. You know, you can tie them to standard economic indicators. So you're setting your benchmark of um, the total medical expense per capita. You could tie the growth in that total of medical expense per capita to the growth in the state domestic product, um, the growth in the consumer price index, the growth, growth in, you know, national health expenditures. There are a number of ways of doing this. You could just sit around and pick a number. You know, you can say 6% is too high. We want to go to 5% next year and 4% the year after and 3% the year after. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to go about setting those. But the idea is to have a number that everybody's looking at. And the same around quality, that you can choose some standard national health care quality measures that are going to be the quality measures that New Hampshire is focusing on and hold everybody to those same measures. You know, instead of everybody negotiating different ones in every contract, you know, health, every provider, you know, they're, they're working with all these different payers and each one's asking for five different quality measures and that makes 25 altogether. You know, you can have a standard set and everyone's moving the same way. And then the idea is that you have an entity that is measuring how each of the entities, how each healthcare provider is doing, how each health plan is doing against these benchmarks and publishes how we're doing. And that can be, you know, a state agency that's responsible for doing that measurement and reporting. It can be a new entity with a board and you can decide who, who's the most trusted entity. There are a lot of different ways to do that. But basically, let's see, I have a little picture of what this looks like. Um, and so the idea is, you know, we're, you know, zero cost, cost growth is down here. You set your benchmark wherever you set it. And then you're looking at each healthcare provider, each hospital or physician group, um, health plan premiums. What does that cost growth look like against the benchmark? What does it look like for the whole state? Is the whole state's healthcare growth, you know, cost per total medical expense per capita? the growth in total medical expense per capita for the whole state. Did we beat the line? We under the line. If we're, you know, our cost for the whole state is over where we want it to be, then you start looking at individual entities. You know, where is it that we're going over the line? And for those, you know, providers that are going over the line, are their costs higher than their peers? You know, it might be that there's just some area of prescription drugs, for example, where, you know, the new hep C drug came in and it's very expensive and there's nothing you can do about that. But there are other areas where it's this different. You know, some providers cost growth is off the chart and others are really down below. And if we can really focus attention on where the cost growth is, that that can have some effect. So, let me see. And then, you know, you need to think about whether you want to establish some consequences for failing to meet those benchmarks. So, you know, in the, in the situation where the whole state cost growth is above the benchmark and an individual's entity's costs are above the benchmark and they're way above their peers and you can think about who their peers are, that's a whole decision area, what are you going to do about that? Well, so the first thing is, you know, you post their name and the benchmark on a website and that's kind of embarrassing. What's the next step after that? You could require a performance improvement plan. You could impose a fine. You could say, you know, actually, you've gone three years above the cost benchmark and you're our, you know, sore thumb, you're really driving the whole state the wrong way. We're gonna set rates for you. That one entity that isn't with the program, we're gonna set rates just for them. Not for the whole state, not for everybody else who's complying, but just for them. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different levels that you could apply. And, you know, again, you're going to have to think about for your, as a state, what's going to work best for you. And, you know, and I would say the same thing on the quality side. You want to have some standard benchmarks. Look at entities that aren't meeting the quality benchmarks, that aren't um, improving, that aren't keeping up with their peers, and apply some consequences. Um, and then on the reporting side, um, there's this idea about standard, um, standard basis of payment. I understand that there was a bill that was filed in the legislature recently around this. So you could require that all plans pay providers the same way. So for inpatient services, there's a standard payment per DRG. There's a you know, standard payment per RBRVS, you know, and that, that the, the 
plans and the providers get to negotiate about the level, but the, the standard basis of payment. Um, and that makes it easier to compare. So, you know, if you say, you know, for DRG 421, this entity pays $4,000 and this one pays $3,000, it's really easy to see that the 4,000 is more than the 3,000. It's just easier. Um, it's not necessary. I mean, you can do calculations to actually convert payment levels to some kind of standard basis and say overall, you know, this payer is playing this provider at this level and this one at this level, and you can do that. So this is just an option to think about if you think it might be easier to compare. And I'm going to pass this on to Rachel to talk about the next couple options. Thanks, Catherine. And in our second proposed comprehensive strategy, we consider ways to encourage the New Hampshire marketplace to engage in alternative payment methods with the goal of rewarding providers for efficiency and outcomes rather than volume. New Hampshire has really been the leader in this already. And researchers at Dartmouth conceived of a related concept, the Accountable Care Organization, or ACO. ACOs are large provider-based entities responsible for the cost and quality of care for their population. And they, use, they typically use alternative payment methods. New Hampshire hosts many alternative ACOs across the state and has been involved in pay reform in the private sector as well as new initiatives in Medicare and Medicaid. Reg Regional technical assistance for payment reform was part of New Hampshire's latest SIMS grant award. And as of 2011, New Hampshire's carriers relied primarily on traditional payment methods, but we're expecting that to increase with all the initiatives that are happening. We um, we note that providers generally want to participate in alternative payment methods from our work on the stakeholder views, and we suggest that um, New Hampshire continue to encourage that development. I'd like to take a step back and explain and explore why New Hampshire might want to engage in alternative payment methods. Right now, a lot of healthcare payment is what's called fee for service. A lot of you probably all already know this, but I'm going to go through a little bit of some of the reasoning behind alternative payments to think through um, what structures we might want to get in the future and, and how other laws and policies might be affected. So right now, a lot of healthcare payment is paid fee-for-service, which means a provider performs a service, submits a bill, and gets paid for that service. This can be pretty good for a number of services, especially when you want to look at um, maintaining a certain volume of services. However, in much of healthcare, fee-for-service can result in some negative effects on the quality and cost of care. I'll look at two right now. Number one, providers get paid more for performing a large volume of services, whether or not those services actually result in better health care for patients. For example, studies have found that hospitals actually get paid more when they make medical mistakes in surgery because more services are billed as a result of those mistakes. Of course, providers are not deliberately trying to do medical mistakes in surgery or other services. However, fee-for-service can make it hard to work on both cost and quality improvements at providers. Number two, under a fee-for-service system, providers don't always get reimbursed for those services that really help bring a cost, um, bring care into the quality. So for example, if you have a diabetic patient and you would like to pay them a phone call to make sure that they're keeping up with their protocol for their, um, for their situation, that may not be reimbursed. But if that diabetic patient gets admitted into a hospital because of poor follow-up care, that would be reimbursed. So that's another issue with fee-for-service, where some services that would be very helpful for the care of, of patients aren't reimbursed. We can seek to address both issues with alternative payment methods by giving providers the flexibility to pay for health, helpful services and holding providers accountable for the cost and health of the patient population. Alternative payment methods are generally more global in nature, giving providers more flexibility and more financial risk. As I mentioned previously, these payment methods are often found in ACOs. Recently, there's been a big rise in the number of ACOs across the country through Medicare, Medicaid, and on the private market. 
Early studies on ACOs shows cautiously promising results on both cost and quality. We recommend that New Hampshire continue to monitor these results as ACOs um, mature. Recent, um, so if New Hampshire were to move its private market towards alternative payment methods and ACOs, how could they do it? What are the barriers that, they, that might keep providers and carriers from entering into these types of contracts? How can we transition from alternative payment methods that reward for providers for efficiency and outcomes rather than volume? One barrier to participation is complexity. Different ACO contracts have different features related to payment, quality, and care delivery. Providers will have a difficult time managing contracts with wildly different features, as my colleague Catherine so aptly described. New Hampshire could develop a model contract for use between health plans and providers that offer standardization on various terms. Another barrier to being able to participate in alternative payment contracts is having a voice in the ACO policy early on. New Hampshire could convene a multi-stakeholder commission to be involved in the model contract process, either helping to edit the model contract itself or offering an alternative model. The providers, payers, employers, consumers, and state agency representation on the commission could work with each other to make sure that we um, work on a path forward that everyone agrees. It should include an individuals involved in current payment reform initiatives, including the latest SIM grant participants. Recent national policy may help New Hampshire move forward towards alternative payments and ACOs. Medicare just re revised its um, shared savings ACO program to include more upfront payments for ACOs and to also give priority to rural ACOs. Um, just last week, there was a federal law passed. I, gasp in the room. There was a federal law passed, and it included a lot of, um, you may have heard about it, it was around the Medicare um, payment formula and also the CHIP reauthorization, but underneath those big gains, there were a couple, uh, there were a lot of other medical issues that the bill dealt with. And one of them included giving providers an incentive if they participate in alternative payment methods through their Medicare payment rate. Um, a shout out to Joel Ario. There was also a pro provision that dealt with one of the fraud and abuse provisions, signaling that they're going to relax it a little bit in some ways and also study ways to relax it more. So it looks like the federal government has gotten your message, fraud and abuse. And so the model contract for ACOs could address a number of areas. I will change my slide now. If providers go out of, oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong place. Excuse me. It could address the payment methodology. For example, whether to go in the direction of global payments or shared savings. Usually, ACOs around the country either go in one or of the two directions. Under global payments, a provider gets paid upfront, usually a lump sum or a budget according to their patient population. Under shared savings, the provider is typically, the ACO is typically paid throughout the year fee for service, and then at the end of the year, they'll share in savings with the payer and perhaps share in losses depending on the contract. Um, the model payment could also look at issues including financial readiness requirements that have to do with the financial risk that Mr. Ario was talking about and also care coordination, quality, and consumer protection requirements. I'll now turn to two particular issues we thought the New Hampshire could look at when considering the ACO development. The first one is around provider risk bearing. Alternative payments put financial risk on providers. If providers go out of business as a result of that risk, that is bad for both patients, providers, and the state. The state could address this issue, protecting ACOs that take on excessive financial risk in a number of ways. And these are a couple of suggestions we came up with that um, work around Joel Ario's suggestions around uh, moderated um, positions where you're not a full capitated insurance company, but you're also not a fee-for-service taking on no risk. 
So the first thing the state could do is when designing its model contract, make a strategic decision about how large the ACO can be before it can take on risk. Usually larger ACOs have more financial cushion than smaller ACOs, so making that decision can help around the risk readiness issue. As I mentioned on the last slide, the model contract could also include provisions that ensure providers have enough assets and other protective features, such as stop loss insurance. The state could establish a review body, and this is the idea that um, Joel brought up from Massachusetts, where um, a state body makes sure that risk is being handled appropriately by taking a look at different providers that take on a certain amount of risk and certifying them in order to have them be able to participate in the market. So we also addressed antitrust concerns. Um, so ACOs may trigger antitrust consideration, including price fixing, collusion, and taking on too much market power. Both state and federal antitrust laws can apply, and I'll address each one in turn. For state antitrust, New Hampshire could consider developing its ACO program in coordination with other state agencies to make sure that policy goals align for providers. New Hampshire could coordinate reform efforts and antitrust issues across state agencies. We're not suggesting that the state water down its antitrust law, but there should be a cons consistent message to providers about what activities are desirable and what activities receive scrutiny. For federal antitrust, as Joel mentioned, ACOs participated, pr who participate in the Medicare Shared Savings Program receive some protection from federal antitrust law in their commercial activities. However, this does leave out some providers who aren't participating in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and also providers who are in MSSP but don't necessarily have commercial contracts that mirror the MSSP provisions, MSSP standing for Medicare Shared Savings. For, for those providers that are following the model contract, in this private market, the state might want to consider the, um, the comprehensive standard of supervision that Mr. Ario was mentioning um, so that providers could point to state action immunity if they receive scrutiny from the federal government. Um, as was mentioned before, there's been a Supreme Court case this year and a Supreme Court case two years ago that means that this is an evolving state of law that New Hampshire should keep an eye out when considering what to do around this issue. So that's our proposed strategy number two, promoting an alternative payment methods and ACOs in the state while navigating issues related to complexity, provider risk, and antitrust. Our proposed strategy number three recognizes that New Hampshire has a lot of small businesses. These small businesses have a disadvantage when purchasing health insurance. They do not have a lot of market power. <laughs> New Hampshire could consider strengthening small business purchasing power to negotiate better rates. Options for strengthening the power of small businesses and in purchasing insurance can include um, having an employee choice in the shop exchange, health insurance purchasing collaboratives, or an association product on the exchange. All of these options have complications and warrant further study. Did I do it right this time? Yeah. Now I turn to some short-term steps for reform. These reforms can be implemented separately or with proposed longer-term reforms. As easier first steps toward comprehensive strategies, they may have some immediate benefit and lay the ground for the comprehensive uh, reform that we already laid out. New Hampshire can continue to expand data privacy, data transparency. Um, in, with considerations for data privacy, of course. Um, New Hampshire has been a national leader in data transparency, as you know. The state boasts a public database that offers price information and consumer-friendly website and has been a model for other states. 
New Hampshire can build on these initiatives with activities to enhance premium transparency, enhanced provider price transparency, and quality transparency. All of these issues are laid out in our report. New Hampshire could also coordinate and leverage available resources to seek funding for longer term reform. Specifically, funding could fund commissions, oversight, and other activities. Available resources may be available from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center, which has funding through 2019 and has already funded two SIMS grants for New Hampshire. Continuing with our short-term steps, um, New Hampshire could establish a commission charged with recommending payment reform policy and legislation. Payment reform is a complicated topic, as you may be noticing with our, with our presentations. Um, a commission could act as a convener of stakeholders who sift through the complexity and come out with a single path forward. The commission could include hospitals, clinicians, other providers, payers, employers, consumers, and representatives from state agencies. And really the idea is if we come up with a, a single path forward, then the issues, uh, the legal issues and the policy issues can focus on that path and, and, and move forward rather than having a lot of different options that, that kind of sit. So having a commission that really looks at all the issues and, and thinks through a path would be helpful. Finally, New Hampshire could consider expanding consumer protections in light of its reform path. New policies may bring up concerns from the consumer perspective. For example, if you pay providers on a global basis, that's going to be changing the way decisions are made, perhaps, and um, concerns about underutilization may be brought up. The state could consider activities including improved quality measurement, utilization monitoring, and working with new grievance and appeal structures. Our final slide deals with some standalone reforms that can be implemented separately or together with comprehensive reforms. First, New Hampshire could reform its certificate of need process. The certificate of need in general refers to New Hampshire's process of reviewing large expansions in healthcare services offering, offered by providers. Certificate of need is in place to help rein in healthcare costs. We recommend that certificate of need be aligned with any payment reform that happens. For example, organizations participating in ACOs might be expedited through the certification process. Finally, New Hampshire reform could reform certain nonprofit laws to do with nonprofit hospitals. With changes in the healthcare marketplace, New Hampshire has the opportunity to consider how its nonprofit laws could apply to hospitals. Typically, in order to get nonprofit status, hospitals have to show a community benefit, and often this community benefit has to do with paying for uninsured payment patients. As the Affordable Care Act is enacted and the number of uninsured payment patients in the population goes down, there may be a windfall to hospitals, though that might be offset by um, decreasing other payments such as disproportionate share. New Hampshire should analyze this, look at whether hospitals are receiving a windfall, and perhaps think about using the community benefits option to promote population health or some other payment reform related activities. New Hampshire could also consider, uh, also continue to monitor executive salaries at hospitals relative to regional norms. Thank you all for attending our presentation. We now have some time for questions. And uh, we know that the CON law is set to sunset. Um, Tyler might be able to tell me, but it's 16, 16 in 2016. Are you saying, uh, including that in one of your recommendations, are you saying that uh, this would, there is still a role for the CON process in the state of New Hampshire? Um, well, I think. Um, that any <clears throat> policy can be, uh, that's perhaps too broad, 
uh, most policies can be um, defined in a way that's effective or not effective. You know, so if you put it under a certain label, there's certainly uh, certificate of need uh, provisions that can be ineffective. Uh, <clears throat> and there's, you know, research on um, the effectiveness of uh, certificate of need is, has somewhat mixed findings, depending in part on what, you know, how it's defined and how the process works. Um, what's clear is that the, at least in our um, limited reading of the certificate need law that's in place now that's going to be sunsetting, <clears throat> it was written for a different world, uh, the healthcare system of uh, some years back, and that if to the extent that that can still be a policy tool going forward. It definitely needs to be revisited with respect to how uh, it works. Um, I think if you think about the ultimate implications for uh, provider risk bearing um, and as it bears on capital decisions in provider organizations, um, you know, under a fee for service world, uh, you know, a, 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 an expensive scanner is a profit center. Um, in, a, in an accountable care world with, with global payment, uh, that's just cost. Um, and you know the the real infrastructure investments might be more targeted towards um, information technology that allows for coordinated care um, and and better measurement of quality and outcomes in the patient population and so forth. So um, I think I would say that rethinking that I don't have an answer for that question exactly, but I would I would not set it aside and say it's not worth thinking about. It might be worth um, uh, revisiting in light of the way the the delivery system is evolving. Thank you very much for your presentation. So my question is, is if we see this natural evolution in New Hampshire moving towards ACOs, risk bearing, and the right triggers in place to protect that risk bearing, why would we need to adopt a single way of doing it so that we can move forward? Because I see this very natural progression, and I don't think we've had time to see if it's worked yet. So can you just comment on that, perhaps? Are you asking about the model contract? Um, I have a thought. Do you want to um, the, uh, I think the, if you look at what happened in the, the 1990s capitation wave that uh, Joel mentioned, um, I, th I think it failed because uh, providers did not have the expertise, the infrastructure, and the data um, to handle that. And I think uh, I see there being a real risk of, of that being repeated. I think circumstances are better now than they were then. But I have been continually, um, uh, you know, I'll say shocked at the uh, some of the uh, arrangements that I've seen in place. Um, if if you understand the process that the department goes through uh, to set um, a review rates that are submitted by carriers, and you look at a rate filing, what you see in there is a cost basis historically, a trend rate, and then an add-on for for profit charge, which has to do with uh, compensating the carrier for risk bearing. That, that's basically the price that they get for bearing the risk for the contract. Uh, and then the, you know, there might then be a contract that says uh, for, for risk sharing that turns around and, and, and if that trend rate was, I've seen a contract recently, not in New Hampshire, but um, the, the rate filing has a rate of growth of 6% and the uh, target, you know, the, the uh, contract that a provider signed with that carrier uh, for this, essentially the same population has a target rate of growth of zero uh, and there's no there's no uh, no no savings sharing on the part of the uh, for the provider below if its costs are above zero. Um, so that's not a contract I would advise a provider to go into. Um, but the uh, I don't think that the recommendation has to do with the uh, state um, defining what the contract terms are. But I think it can set up a model contract that contains provisions and issues that should be addressed in any agreement to make sure that it's being done in a way that's, you know, likely to succeed. I don't think anybody wants to go back to um, to have to retreat back to fee for service again. And the only way to avoid that um, is to make sure that what happens going forward can succeed in a way sufficiently for all the parties to stay in the deal. So. Just a quick follow-up. Can oh. I, I just want to add a little bit, so and then you can ask the same again. Um, so I'm not sure that we've said that, that you need to have a model contract, but that you know it would be helpful. It could be helpful depending on what issues you see. And one of the current concerns that we highlighted was that 
the market here is not functioning well in a competitive way. And that means that there are certain entities that have more market power and others that have less market power. And so in a contracting arrangement, generally what happens is terms are dictated by the entity that has more market power and the others take the terms. So if you want to set up a system that you think is actually fair or the same across the state, you know, where providers have similar terms with all these different payers, um, where payers have similar terms with all of their different provider groups, then a model contract would be a way to get there. But again, I mean, you know, this is for all of you to, to develop a shared vision. A model contract is one way to take a shared vision and kind of put it on paper. This is what we mean by the shared vision. So it's, it's, it's a mechanism, but it's not necessarily the only one. My follow-up was just noting that I think here in New Hampshire, I, I, I work for Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, so I work for one of the insurers, and frankly, we were the underdog for a lot of years, and we developed these mechanisms to compete with the larger carrier, mm -hmm. and it worked out fine doing it ourselves. Sure. But I think the idea is that um, we've seen this level of progression and protections, I think, in our contracts over time, and I just think we learned from the managed care era, all of us, so mm -hmm. the health plans, the providers learned from those contracts of the early 90s or the later 90s, and I think that we've built some of that in. So I just, I think that natural ev evolution has been helpful to our market. Thank you. Hey, Catherine. Uh, early in your presentation, you talked about provider pricing disparities that were unrelated to quality or to acuity of care. Um, and I think it's, uh, in other states, we've seen implementation of benchmark cost um, growth caps. We've seen implementation of transparency, CON, um, those types of initiatives, but without any recognition or adjustment of the, those underlying price disparities. And in particular, I, um, I think there's been concern that implementing a, a cost growth benchmark without addressing the underlying basis on which that Mm -hmm. that is um, implemented um, perpetuates some of the, the market power disparities that you were just speaking to. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could address the underlying issue of provider cost disparities and how you see that playing into these reforms that you're recommending. It's a good point. Um, so, you know, it's the same thing that we also talk about with quality, you know, where the, the big debate with quality benchmarks is, you know, do you reward an, a provider for beating the benchmark or for improving? Well, you kind of want to do both, right? You want to encourage them for, for do, getting better from where they are and also for beating the benchmark. I think the same idea is with cost growth. Um, you need to look at the average cost relative to peers and again, you know, what, what, do you look, what your measure is for average cost and what the peer group is is really a key thing to decide. Um, but you want to make sure that that, that uh, entity is similar to their peers or lower cost than their peers, not higher cost than their peers, and then also separately at the growth in cost. So I think that you're right, that you really need to do both. So. Thank you. I have a question uh, related to your third strategy of studying options to strengthen purchasing power of small businesses. I'm a small business person, and I'm also uh, a board member of a nonprofit, which in effect is also a small business, and in New Hampshire we have a very large number of nonprofits. And given your point that New Hampshire has a large number of small businesses, I'm curious about why um, there isn't more, and also recognizing that the market isn't functioning as well in this state as it is in other states. I'm wondering, have you looked at maybe the relationship between the number of small businesses who really are not in a position of any power in this state um, in purchasing health insurance? Um, and what strategies might, it seemed like it got very short treatment. Um, and I'm just wondering, maybe that's a bigger piece, or have you looked at to what extent could strengthening the power of small businesses help the market in healthcare? Um, yes, uh, the, just uh, I'll address different parts of that. First of all, the, uh, the recommendation it really is that that's something worth more study. Uh, it was not really uh, sort of central to the scope of what we were doing, but uh, it was very clear as we you know, looked at and thought about the market here 
that um, with all the other reforms that we are recommending, the basic imbalance between the concentrated market on the provider and carrier space, and then the fragmented marker, market on the purchaser side was a fundamental imbalance that, that deserved further study. Um, the solutions there are, um, I, th I think one of the reasons it needs further studies because it's, it's, it's complicated and not necessarily easy, easy to solve. Um, certainly the, um, you know, the, uh, the, ex the, the exchange allows for some shopping, uh, which, which is uh, so helpful in the individual market, but in the, in the small group market, now that the shop is there, you do have um, the choice of plans at, at a company level to uh, choose as a, uh, as a small business. And let me say that I, I too am a small business owner, so I very much appreciate your perspective on what it's like to look at uh, that renewal every year. Um, the, uh, the, I think one of the first uh, sort of immediate suggestion we made was to uh, look at uh, uh, including employee choice um, as part of the shop exchange. So in other words, uh, small businesses who use the exchange to purchase their coverage, right now, the way it's set up, um, you, it works the way it does essentially when you go to a broker where you say, all right, am I gonna go with this carrier or this carrier? And then here's the coverage I picked for all of us this year. Um, it, including the option uh, to allow employee choice would um, essentially open up to your employees the ability to go on the exchange and pick any carrier um, and uh, in, in effect, uh, shop as if they were working for a Fortune 500 company and picking among different plans um, that were available to them. And that would allow the individuals to do uh, kind of shopping um, within small businesses. And that that's a, would move that uh, agenda forward uh, slightly, I think. That's a, that's a small step, but I think that would be an important one. Um, the other steps um, that are possible there um, get somewhat complicated uh, particularly with respect to the ACA um, and how the um, requirements of the ACA to have a single risk pool in the small group market um, interact with um, you know, some steps that might be useful. The, the law of, uh, rightfully is intended to prevent um, fragmentation of that market so that there can't be risk selection problems uh, you know, with some group coming in and kind of getting all the low risk uh, population and then driving what would end up being a death spiral in the rest of the population, keeping that all in one pool has some ben uh, benefits to it, but at the same time, um, it doesn't allow the kind of um, negotiating leverage that large employers have when they're when they sit across the table from, um, you know, a carrier and talk about what their, their contract renewal is going to look like and kind of negotiate that number down. Um, I know that from some data that I looked at, the profit margins in the small group business uh, can be quite high, um, and um, I, I think there's potential there. Um, enough to uh, improve the situation for small businesses in a way that's worth spending more time looking at that question. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note that around the, um, Jim was just talking about um, the single risk pool, um, which kind of impedes, it's, it's a section of the Affordable Care Act that um, can be problematic when trying to figure out how to give um, small business employees more choice on the, on the exchange, either the shop or the larger. And there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act, it's called Section 1332. Um, and it comes into effect at, in 2017 that might help to ameliorate some of that. And how that would work is if the state chooses to waive some of the exchange provisions within the state of New Hampshire, they can do so starting in, new, in um, 2017 if they jump through some hoops and get approval from the federal Secretary of Health and Human Services and the federal um, Secretary of Treasury. So there might be a path forward, but it's it's a pretty new area of law. It seems through all the discussion the concepts of consumerism and bringing the patient back into uh, the decision, the, the patient uh, leaning on their trusted um, uh, primary care physician or family physician advisor for advice on what they do. Um, creating symmetric information in a market that has obscured pricing. You've, you've said almost nothing about any of these things today. And I would, I would question why that would be since in pretty much every other marketplace, those things have proven to be the things that you know, allow me to get <clears throat> more than every space shuttle's worth of technology on, in, the, in my pocket. 
Um, why, why are those not top and center of your discussion? Is there some influence on you to, to uh, you know, kind of set those aside for further study? Let me make sure I've got those. So the first one is, uh, you said, uh, better transparency, more information, is that? Yeah, I mean, we have totally asymmetric information mm -hmm. in the healthcare market. We all know that there's no correlation. It's been proven through studies time and again. There's no correlation between price and quality. Um, and so, and, and so the consumer has been completely taken out of the equation. The nice young lady up there who represents many small businesses, as I do, is absolutely right. She, there's nothing she can do. She's on a ship in the, in the sea, in, out in the middle of the ocean, and the waves of the, you know, uh, state, quote unquote, stakeholders that I hear mentioned over and over again, which is, she's not in most of those stakeholder meetings, nor am I. Uh, seem to leave, be leaving her out in the ocean like that. And uh, so where is the discussion around symmetric information, uh, removing antitrust provisions from contracts that basically hamstring a, uh, a provider to not be allowed to publish a cash price that's reasonable instead of 2x what the insurance, is, the insurance carrier would pay for the same thing. Uh, you know, there's, it's just riddled, this whole thing, this whole industry is riddled with these issues, and there's no discussion whatsoever of these things here today. And I'm, I'm just, you know, what's the, what is the force on you as those who are presenting this stuff to not have massive sections and recommendations in here? Is it that, hey, that's for a later time, a later discussion, which I think is kind of what you said a couple of times. Um, I have some things I want to say, but do you want to go ahead first, yeah. Catherine? Yeah. So I, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in front of Jim because this is something I care a lot about. You know, we're all patients. Every one of us is a patient. And we, you know, at this age range, we all have health issues. And I got to say, you know, I just went through a whole thing. I'm an expert in this, right? I know this. I've, I've published prices all over the place. I know exactly where to get them. Um, the New Hampshire Insurance Division has an amazing website that you can go in and put in your zip code and exactly what service you need, and it's going to tell you exactly what you would pay out of pocket. You know, all of that information is out there, and I know it better than anybody. And when I sit down with my doctor and she says, you know, this dumb little health thing that you're not really worried about, I need you to go and do all of these really expensive tests, and you're going to pay a lot out of pocket because I need to make sure that, you know, if there's this, you know, minute chance that you might have something that you might die of in two years, and therefore you have to go and do all these really, really unpleasant tests that are expensive. So I really didn't want to do them, and I did them anyway, because my doctor said so. And that's the world that we live in. We, all of us, listen to our doctors. You find a doctor that you trust, and you do what your doctor says, more or less, or you change to a different doctor, and you do what that doctor says. And you don't... But the doctor, and the doctor needs to know more about price. So, so you need to have a system where the doctor and the whole system that the doctor is part of, because the doctor is not operating on their own. They learned something in medical school 20 years ago, but they work in an office every day where they come in and they have peers and they have a structure around them. And it's there. you can set up a system where physicians sit down together and decide, you know, really based on the evidence, this type of practice is most effective for our patients and most cost effective. And overall in our scheme, we're gonna practice this way. And that's how you change the effectiveness of practice. That's how you change the quality of practice. That's how you change the cost of practice. It's not by every one of us going to medical school and making our own decisions about whether this is worth it or not. No, but, but in, cons in consultation, absolutely. But you know, I, I think that we really need to think about this. You know, empowering consumers, you know, you need to have consumers in the, at the table with the stakeholders. You need to have small businesses at the table as part of the stakeholders. But this is way too complicated for everyday patients. It, consumer empowerment here is not giving, it's too complicated. It's not enough to give everybody the information that they need. You need to build the incentives to actually shift the whole system in favor of consumers. And that's the way that we're gonna get there. It may be the same as the inside of that. I have no idea what's inside of that. Honestly, to me, that's a black box. But somebody else knows what's inside of that box and has spent a lot of time making that little box really efficient. An example might be the recommend that you Without at least understanding the cost benefit options. How about that? 
So, I mean, I think I'll let Jim yeah, jump in in a second. Let me look. I, I guess what I would say to that is that I don't think that you should be making decisions like that on a transaction by transaction basis. That it really needs to be considered in the whole scope of practice. How are we going to practice as a as a group of physicians, as a practice, as a provider group? We are going to practice this way. Overall, this entity is giving us our patients better prices than this entity. Overall, this entity is providing better quality of care for but, our patients. But price should one. not be in the equation because it's too no, complicated. No, it should be in the equation, but not at a transaction yeah, level. Discussion to have. We're, we're, we're running a little behind. I want to make sure you have a I'm chance for I'm jumping in front of Jim. But Jim, I mean, you're, you're raising great points, Mark, and I, I wish we had a limited amount of time to go into them. Sure. And I do want to remind people at the end of the event, we actually have a public comment period where you don't need to ask questions of the folks. You can actually make statements about your feelings, particularly based on what you've heard. So um, I'll leave I'll it I'll be totally quiet. <laughs> a couple just real quick responses. Um, one, I think the, um, the overall, if, if you have a, uh, the overall strategy here, if you have a, a provider organization that is actually a, a being paid a global payment, they now have a financial incentive to have that be part of the decision making process. What, what, how much do things cost and how much, you know, where do we want to put our resources? Because we're working within a fixed budget. Now we have to figure out where to put that money. Now, the, you know, the, the flip side of that is, you know, if it moves fully in that direction, the concern is going to be, are they giving me enough service? Am I, you know, am I getting what I'm paying for or, or not? But in, in measurement needs to happen around that. As far as transparency goes, um, I, you know, I think perhaps maybe you know our, our presentation doesn't reflect it as much as our report does, but uh, absolutely agree. The more transparency, the better. Um, not only in, provi in provider information, but in insurer information. Um, the state uh, has been working on, on, on both those dimensions, and um, better information, I think, for employers and buying when they buy insurance and understanding uh, relative prices and, and what the costs are in, in components and so forth, I think uh, is another frontier that can really be helpful there. Um, so I, if, if we get, didn't give you the message that transparency was a key part of all this, then we didn't get our point across well. So. One more question, I think. Yeah, yeah I'm just wondering if uh, Compass Analytics has done uh, payment reform studies in for any other states that have um, relatively high cost of health care like New Hampshire, and if so, what you've learned and whether any of those things you've learned could be applied here. Uh, well, I, I think we, you know, we have an on, ongoing national experiment uh, happening um, with uh, how to get a handle on these issues. Um, you know, without question, um, the uh, the notion of uh, competing integrated delivery and financing systems, uh, as Joel was talking about, is a concept that works a lot better in uh, Chicago than it does in uh, Franconia. Uh, but the um, uh, the uh, uh, what, what's good about the way the what's happening right now is uh, with our um, uh, federalization, uh, state federal partnership with Medicaid, and the ability of states, uh, for at least those who have chosen to, uh, to have uh, an exchange where they can kind of customize what they they're doing, and then waivers that CMS can make available in the public programs. There are all kinds of different experiments happening nationally. I don't think that we have you know, good, uh, solid results uh, anywhere yet that uh, you can hang your hat on it, uh, as we touched on in the presentation. I think the strategies, you know, rationale for the strategies we're recommending is um, that uh, there are some early promising signs. Certainly the incentives are, are good. Uh, and when you look at some of the early findings, it's, there's some uh, you know, glimmers of hope that it's going to move things in the right direction. Um, the I don't think... Um, any state has, has licked these issues at this point, but um, I also think that there are other states that are comparable profile-wise in terms of population and so forth that don't have um, the same rapid cost growth that New Hampshire's had. So I think the you know the problems aren't the same everywhere either. So I don't have I don't have a, a you know a really good answer for your question yet, but I think uh, it's something that all of us in the healthcare industry are going to be focused on going forward here. I'm just noticing that we're hearing a lot of concerns about, you know, people are comfortable with the status quo and are very nervous about change, and that's to be expected. You really need to think, you know, but you need to ask yourselves, are you happy with the way things are? No. Do you want to change, you know? And if you're going to change something, 
it's going to have to be something that works for the state as a whole. It may not be perfect for any one of you, but by overall, making sure that the state as a whole is going in a better direction could be a good thing. Great. Thank you. Um, good discussion. So just